Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 88. Today we've got another gun gripe episode for you. Today's gun gripe is called Condition is King. And yes it is. It is, and yes it is. Yes it but, is. But the thing we want to really discuss here, we're talking about gun condition. And uh, no, not the condition you're carrying in. We're talking about the actual physical condition of firearms. And we'd like to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, and, and this is kind of, really this gripe goes out to some of the collectors out there, people that are probably looking into uh, you know either advanced gun collecting or maybe uh, you're in a position where uh, <laughs> you're trying to sell a gun and you think maybe you have a little more than you really do. <laughs> and uh, we, we've already did a video on how to assess the value of a used gun and things mm -hmm. to look for in buying a used gun. And, uh, and yes, that video will help a lot of you kind of point you in the right direction and give you some ideas of the kind of things that we look for when it comes to acquiring uh, a used firearm, but what we're going to really um, talk about mainly is condition and how it really factors into value. So once you've looked at the specimen and you, you've determined that you've liked it, where condition really uh, matches value and, and trying to kind of assess that a little bit. Indeed. I mean, we do have some gripes about this too. We've been at some gun shows and some gun shops in the past and, you know, the prices that they have on some of these guns, you're like, you're out of your mind. I know. <laughs> For so, real. So someone's either building air castles because they think that they have, uh, they, they have the P-17 that Alvin York used or whatever, uh, or you got some guy who, who every gun show's got the guy who claims to, to have a gun that Hitler owned. Okay, and, and I mean, damn, how many guns did he <laughs> did he have? But but anyway, the thing is, you know, everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a little gimmick when it comes to trying to sell some highly collectible gun. And, and I guess that's kind of its own little thing in its own regard. But uh, condition, when it comes to value, especially on military and antiques and collectibles, condition very much is king mm -hmm. when it comes to demanding uh, a high price. And a lot of that comes down to being a, a, a savvy buyer and a savvy consumer and doing the proper amount of research mm -hmm. to make sure that what you're getting is, a, a, one, what they say it is, and two, uh, that you're actually getting the genuine article, something that, you know, like there's a lot of fake number five carbines out there, and someone who yeah. doesn't understand what they're looking at might buy a gun that was just converted from a number four or whatever, and just thinking, oh, I got a, I got a jungle carbine for 300 bucks. Well, guess what? It's not no, a real jungle carbine. So there's little things like that. I mean, there's so many instances like that that could kind of play into this gripe. Uh, I mean, like, we always go back to the guy that had the Mauser broom handle at a gun show, <laughs> and with a dang ugly, I'm not even talking a well-engraved Puma. Like, a five-year-old could engrave a Look. Puma better than was uh, what was on the side of this Mauser, and the guy wanted premium Mauser broom handle money for, for a gun that had a Puma engraved on the Look. side of it. I, I would have loved to have had like a camera sitting by to catch the look on our faces. We picked this thing up and like literally, okay, so it's on the table. All right, it's just sitting there like this. We walk up, we're like, oh, check this out, a little broom handle, blah, 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 flip it over. We're like, ugh. Well, it's not this gun, obviously. It's obviously not this one, but <laughs> you literally turn it over and on the side of the magazine well here, or the, the cartridge well, there's a freaking Puma engraved on it. We're like, what is this? And, and it wasn't even well done either. And the guy was like, oh man, that thing's highly collectible. Like, not with a Puma on it. Right. What are and, you talking and then, about? And then, of course, the statement is always, you collectors. You collectors. You collectors. Put that on a t-shirt. Why can't you just buy it and shoot it, you collectors? Because we don't want it with a Puma on it, Trust dude. me, you're guys. Crazy. If you're trying to God. sell a Mauser broom handle with a Puma <laughs> engraved on it, you're not going to get $3,000 Mauser broom handle money out of it. <sighs> okay, so it's all about understanding what you, <laughs> if, if, for one, if you're a seller, understanding what you have and understanding limitations like how much uh, there is to bite off on that piece. And then two, if you're a buyer, understanding when to just go, okay, yeah, I'm walking away. Yeah. All right, so here's a good example, all right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a Springfield trap door. Uh, sporter and it's actually in a a very rare and collectible cadet stock unfortunately someone decided to put some mijong tiles on the side of it so they <laughs> they did some like hasty you know inletting on the stock and they put some mijong tiles in there with their initials on it and you know they fitted this uh you know, horribly it, fitted. No, no, that's uh, not even fitted. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, they, they, put this, this, they put this ugly recoil pad on the back of it. The stock's been refinished. The, it's all the, bubbling up. The stock's been refinished horribly. The metal has been polished to heckin' back. You know, you can't even see the eagle on the gun and everything like that. And uh, the gun's been rebarreled. 
All right, I picked this rifle up for 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my mind, I thought, heck, even the gun with some Puma, uh, well, the Puma, with the Mijong tiles mm -hmm. on the side, this might be something fun to get get in the woods and, you know, just have a fun little trap door to go shoot at Bambi with or well, something. Well, I probably would have bought it too. I mean, so, right. so what, okay? They ruined the stock, but there are other stocks available. You can get a reproduction stock, yeah. like a full length stock, like this period correct uh, trap door here has, mm -hmm. and drop it on there and just have you a very nice shooter. You could. Mm -hmm. so. And another option too is if you're really handy with woodworking, you could actually kind of fill fill those spots where the Mijong tiles were and you could find mm -hmm. you a proper like, you know, cadet butt plate and refit a butt plate to it. You could. You can see the spot on the top of the stock here where they filled it in where the top of the butt plate, you can see kind of goes over the back. Mm -hmm. Where the screws go in, they fill that in and then fit a sporting butt plate. You could fit the proper butt plate back on it and fill it in, and yeah, it's still a cadet stock. So, I mean, you might have 300 bucks just for the stock to somebody who really, really needs a stock for their project. Yep. Now, without going further down the rabbit hole, here's another Springfield trap door that, in my mind, this is very, very collectible because, for one, the guy that I bought it from, it's been in his family since it was issued. Mm -hmm. So that's cool to have the story and to know this was a family heirloom uh, that was passed down lovingly <clears throat> throughout the generation. And the guy really didn't want to sell it. Like, he this, almost kind of had like a little tear in his eye when he was selling it because he's yeah. like, man, you know what? This well, is my this grandpa's was, gun. This was a gun show find too. So this right. is just one of those things you cruise around a gun show and you, you know, see you're like, wow. This, this, this gun has a real supple leather sling on it that has been used and used and used and used. You can tell it was on someone's shoulder <clears> for a long time. But well cared for. And well cared for. And, you know, the gun has some nice even wear through and throughout. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of bluing loss except where you would really expect to see it, obviously, on some of the exposed metal. Uh, I have had this gun out of the stock, and the underside of it's beautiful, so it's been, you know, no, no pitting mm -hmm. under the wood line. Guys, this is an example of a very nice collectible uh, gun with a little bit of providence to it, mm -hmm. and the fact that, uh, you know, you've also got a, you know, a gun that's been lovingly cared for, and you can shoot it and enjoy it, mm -hmm. and it's no big deal because it's, it's not like an issue condition. It's so nice you can't shoot it, no. but this is a thousand dollar gun. So you're talking a grand plus for a nice trap door versus this gun that's 300 bucks. They're both trap doors, but one is worth three times, almost four times, or whatever, as much as the other one. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of condition being king. And you know, it is what it is. Yep, I mean, another thing, okay, infields. All right, when you're shopping for infields, for the love of Pete, take a headspace gauge with you. You yep. know, but. We've discussed that in, in some of the previous videos, you know, Infields are notorious for uh, being really, really picky when it comes to headspace. You know, the way that the, the infield headspace is and the way that that headspace is kind of repaired and adjusted is by changing out the bolt heads. Mm -hmm. And as the gun gets more and more wear out, you put progressively uh, larger bolt mm -hmm. heads in it to which make are, up the additional uh, headspace. Which are impossible to find. And which are impossible to find. So, so all, all the bigger bolt heads are non-available because all the people that have them that need them, are, they're in guns. So. This uh, this number number one mark three here. Okay, this is my grandfather's gun, and it's a sporter that he did. Okay, so he took a standard military rifle, cut the stock down, the whole nine yards, and made a sporting rifle out of it. The sights are painted. We've shown this gun off in a couple of other videos, but this gun actually shoots very very well, and it doesn't destroy brass because it actually headspaces quite well. Right. You know, but However, it's never going to be worth more than two hundred bucks. But for somebody who wanted an infield and they wanted a good shooter if they were savvy they were like okay wow this thing headspace is quite well maybe i'll just buy a period correct military stock and i'll drop it back in and do some woodwork on it and everything and refinish yep. it and have a very nice shooter sure it's not collectible at that point really but if it suits your fancy then it could be it could be it for could sure be. so now on the other hand this little 410 musket here that eric picked up recently which I say this all the time, like I'm insanely jealous of because I love infields. This thing is in awesome shape. Yep. I love it. So oh, uh, wow. a, lot, a lot of these guns were made for like Indian uh, police forces and things like that. And a lot jailers of colonies. And such, yeah, yeah, and jailers. And uh, I guess they, they didn't want a, a jailer or a guy walking around with a, with a 303 <laughs> with, a rifle. with 10 rounds in it and Ow! shooting protesters and stuff. <laughs> and I think they were also worried with a lot of theft, you know, like back yep. then, you know, if an armory got raided or something. They didn't want, you know, I guess all the bad guys running around with 10-shot infields or whatever mm -hmm. when, you know, if, if they raid the police department, all they're going to get is some single-shot 410 riot guns. But this is an example of a very collectible gun. Mm -hmm. um, I had a guy at a gun show one time 
that was trying to tell me that some Bubba sporterized this gun, or not this particular gun, but one but, like yeah. it. I had a guy at a gun show trying to convince me, oh, you don't want that because uh, some guy uh, plugged that wood in there and, and, like, and drilled shot. the barrel out. Like, he was trying to make up this elaborate story. Oh, that turned it into the, a smooth bore, you know, uh, yeah. muzzle loader, man. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, some people will, will fabricate a bunch of nonsense about certain guns, and I don't know why, but some people, I guess, they just they get, get off on, on making mm. things up. But he didn't, I had to explain to him, I'm like, no, that's actually a completely, perfectly good example of an Arsenal converted 410 uh, number, uh, number one Mark III. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, great gun, you know, overall. So, one of those things that just is kind of different, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Another example of condition is king, kind of, it, it's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum where the gun looks really good, but it's not a good shooter. You know, we've had a few of those in the past. Uh, Eric and I were fighting over P17. I went to go get some cash out of the ATM, and he already bought it by the time I came back to the table. I was like, "God, dang it, Eric!" Yeah. But you ended know, up not being a yeah, great we, of a shooter. We can't get it to shoot, but you know, Kevin's got one we did a video on, and that thing's a little bit more worse for wear. But that thing pits the freaking ace, yep. man. You know, it's just funny. I've got a Gewehr 98 that it's it shoots okay. It looks really good because it was professionally refinished from an estate. I bought it from a, an estate. Um, room in Vegas, uh, one of the antique arms shows out there. Yeah. I picked it up. I picked up a um, 18 or yeah, an 1888 commission rifle, you know, as well. And honestly, I haven't even shot that gun either. It looks great, but there's no telling whether or not it shoots worth the flip. But the Gewehr doesn't shoot good. Eric has one that looks like it was drugged through the ditch that pits the ace. It shoots. You know? So you can't, you know, it's, it's funny because both guns have really nice bores. But you, you take a uh, eight millimeter Projo and you drop it on the end of the, the muzzle and mine just eats it. And we've talked about that yeah. in the Shopping for Guns video where if you can drop a Projo down the muzzle end and it eats that thing all the way up to the neck of the case, then <laughs> leave it on the table because yeah, it yeah. will not shoot. So you there's know? a lot of things that, you know, condition can really depend on what your end use for the gun is. Like some people collect guns and they're just a, the type of person who's going to buy it no matter what. And maybe they'll never shoot it, but they want to be able to grab it off the wall and then go, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a blah, blah, blah. And they don't mm -hmm. really care if it's functional or not or whatever. Or, and that's fine. Yeah. Now, and then you have some people like, I'm the kind of collector who I shoot everything I collect, period. If I own it and I can't shoot it, I don't want it. Like, I've got a Norwegian Kamalata right here. <laughs> it's one of the oldest guns in this room, and I shoot it. But And, and there's probably people that collect them that go, <gasps> what? You know, but, but the thing is, <laughs> I shoot everything I own. So for my needs as a collector, yes, condition being king is going to be mechanical condition. Yeah. I don't mind if there's some honest wear on the outside of the gun, if there's some bluing wear, even if there's some minor like spots on the stock I might need to repair or something, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that as long as mechanically it's safe to shoot, it headspace is safe, yeah. and it's something I can take out to the range uh, and enjoy whenever yep. I want. For sure, like going back to infields, you know, I, I love infield rifles. I don't know why, I know certain mill cert collectors, they just like certain things, like somebody will collect or try to collect every single Mauser in existence or whatever. They'll Good want, luck. Yeah, or they'll collect, they, they want every Arasaka that was ever made, or they yeah. want like a U.S. collection and things like that. I just am into the infields, and I could really <laughs> care less about whether or not the gun's in shootable shape, or, well, I should say, I mean, they, they should be, they're able to be fired, but if they don't headspace worth the flip, if they eat a gauge and they blow brass out all the time, so what to me, because I, I try to have like one example of each, and I've yeah. got a couple of really nice examples that shoot pretty dang well, but then I've got some others that aren't so much shooters, but they're just filling that niche in my collection. And Well, yeah, I mean, like you, you know, got that Burma contract gun with the matching bayonet. I mean, that's something that, yeah, even if the gun doesn't shoot all that great, yeah. it's still cool because it's got the matching bayonet. So a lot of times... Uh, condition can be gauged on the accessories that are with the gun mm -hmm. as well. So you might like, for instance, like this trap door. If I if I showed up and it had the nice sling on it, maybe a matching bayonet or something. Ooh. Now that adds some considerable value when the numbers on the mm -hmm. bayonet match the gun, especially if it's a gun that's been trekking around for 130 years mm -hmm. and it's still got a matching bayonet with it, guys. That just doesn't happen very often. So the older the gun is, if the bayonet matches and it's got you know that kind of stuff going for it, those are always going to be really, really nice additions to a certain piece. Uh, I know oftentimes, like going back to the infields that Chad's likes here, um, you know, you're talking like 
uh, paper wrapped, like oh. out of the crate in field. You know, you'll go to gun shows from time to time and you'll see those where the gun is in Cosmoline with the paper wrapped around it with the twine and it's fresh out of the crate, unissued, <laughs> ready to go. Now, yeah, that gun is going to command a premium because it's an unissued rifle. Yeah. You are basically going in a time machine, going back and getting that gun brand new. So you go all the way from unissued all the way down to a parts gun. It just depends on the condition. And, and assessing that condition, guys, is an art form that requires study and work and time. And it takes some effort on your part to learn about what you're dealing with so you can make sure that you're making an informed decision and you're not wasting your hard-earned mm -hmm. money on something that's not going to serve the purpose that you want it to serve. I mean, we've both gotten burned in the past before because we've made just yep. impulse purchases, not really knowing about a particular gun. And then we get home, we start researching, and we're like, eh, this might not have been the smartest thing, you know. But every now and again, right. you get lucky. But right. like Eric said, you know, it takes time and it takes knowledge and research to uh, develop the... the uh, capability of judging the quality of the gun, like even judging whether or not a number five jungle carbine is real, takes a considerable amount of reading. You have to know and, what you're looking at. You know, and you've got to remember these things and study the receivers and things like that and yeah. the cutouts and, and everything like that and the side arrangements and the markings and all that stuff has to stay up here. And yeah. it's tough. It really is. You but, know, when, when somebody walks up and, and they say, yeah, you know, that guy right there, man, he is an encyclopedia of gun knowledge. Guys, that's not a term that's thrown around lightly. I mean, you look at a guy like Ian oh my gosh, over yeah. at Forgotten Weapons, and I know a lot about guns, guys, okay? But Ian is, is no slouch. Like, he knows his stuff. He is literally a walking library. And, guys, that's what you have to do. You have to take the time to learn and research. You, you have to really want what you're, what you're striving for. Anything in, in life worth doing is worth doing 110%. Mm -hmm. Buy books. Read stuff. You know, take our advice if you care to. Take Ian's advice. You're not going to go wrong. Guys, there's never been a better opportunity uh, to learn about firearms and especially collectible firearms oh, for sure. than there is right now. You got guys like Ian out there. You got, uh, guy, I'd like to think I try to do somewhat as best I can to cover the, the classics as best I can. But then you got <clears throat> CNR Arsenal. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the guys over at Cap and Ball, which he's a wonderful dude that d does a lot of stuff with black powder. Uh, I know I'm, I'm leaving, uh, was it British Muzzle Loaders? British Muzzle Loaders, yeah. He does a lot with the martinis yep. and such. And, and he uh, is, his channel yeah. is indispensable for learning about the classics, especially oh, yeah. British military. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of shooting with the Snyder. Uh, he does a lot of shooting with the Martini. And also, the fellow over at Murphy's Muskets. Yeah. Uh, he does a great job of really showing off a lot of the classics and uh, some really cool stuff like needle fire guns and uh, pin fire guns mm -hmm. and things that require a considerable amount of effort well, to make the ammunition. British, I like British muzzle loaders quite a bit because he dresses up in period correct garb and has all the correct yeah. accessories and accoutrements and everything to go along with the guns. Yeah. And he tries to use the firearms in a period correct fashion, you know, yeah. with the specific loading sequences that they would have taught in the military at the time, which is really, really neat. It takes a lot of time and dedication and just enjoyment to do that kind of stuff. It does. And, it know. takes dedication and a serious, a serious uh, investment in uh, financial resources as well. Uh, also, you look at like channels like Gun Geek, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Scotty over there, he's a great dude. And I don't know how, if he posts much anymore, but I know for a long time he was posting a lot of information about all different kinds, especially the classics. And mm -hmm. a lot of the channels we're mentioning are specifically kind of in tune with more of the classics, uh, more mm -hmm. of the vintage military, uh, collectibles, historical guns, and things like that. So, uh, you know, we, we've always tried to be kind of a multifaceted channel with what we do. We do a little bit of everything. We try mm -hmm. to really enjoy it and put some passion in what we're doing with, with a lot of these classics. But the reason we want to make this gripe is just to, to try to inform people a little bit to do their research. Guys, there's a lot of good books out there. I mean, okay, say you're wanting to buy Mausers. There's tons of books on Mausers that will get you in exactly the direction you need to go to make sure you're identifying every Mauser variant exactly like you need to do without breaking a sweat. What's crazy is there's people out there who've forgotten more about Mausers than you might ever know. Yes. It's insane. And, there, and there's people out there that own just about every Mauser there is, and that's what they do. They collect Mausers, and that's what they do. So guys, no matter what your niche is, no matter what you enjoy, I guess the gripe of this video, or at least the message we want to try to spread is, is do it right. You know, mm -hmm. spend some time and do your research. Be an informed buyer, be an informed collector, and do your best to help those that are also trying to, uh, to follow the same path. <laughs> if you go to the gun show and you see a Puma engraved on the side of a, a Mauser broom handle, 
walk away. Just, just, just leave. You can take a <laughs> selfie with it, maybe. It's like, hey, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks for watching. We had a lot of fun making this video. Uh, we really do appreciate the support. You know, we do have a Patreon account now. If you guys care to donate, you're welcome to. We also sell our man cans. It helps uh, support the channel. Many of you guys have supported man cans throughout the years, and we graciously uh, appreciate uh, your continued support. Uh, we've been staying really busy with a lot of the stuff that we're doing, and uh, you guys are awesome, and we really appreciate all of you. So thanks for watching today. We'll catch you next time. See you guys.